Hello, my name is James Arroyo again, and this is Chapter 7, Supporting Your Ideas. In this chapter, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about how to research and how to get the best information possible, and then converting that into something that's going to support our claims and our organization so that we are saving time and effort in the research process, and then also getting the right information that is going to allow us to be more impactful in our speeches. So let's begin with the difference. The difference between research and support is that research is the process of reviewing an array of published materials, interviews, or field research. In other words, collecting the information. And then support is the information that you pull from that research to put into your speech. We transform a lot of, well, there is a ton of research that we develop. but. Once we have that wealth of information, we cannot put all of it in our speech. Instead, we transfer it to support or tr transform it into support, and that will help us improve the quality of our speech and support our claims. But we start with research. Research, one of the ones that we don't usually think of, but we actually see a lot is interviews. This can happen on TV shows or news networks or anything of the like. We are consistently interviewing people, not to mention jobs, but interviewing someone from the field may help, may provide you with information available in uh, or not available in published material or give new insight. This could be either from someone who is very expert in what they're saying or someone who is more lay, who uh, is not an expert but still has an opinion that is valid in this topic. When we talk about evaluating web-based research, we have to understand that not everything that we find on the internet is going to be useful or credible. So let's jump right in. Uh, look, we want to be sure that we're looking for clues for good information. Some of these uh, could be who presents the information, sets up, and maintains the website. If it is someone who is not credible in this situation, then we may want to reject it. In the same way, what are the credentials of this source? Are they a doctor? Are they a uh, master's? Or are they just a Mr. or Mrs. That may that may uh, that may make us uh, not so sure about the quality of that research. Also, can this information be confirmed? And this is honestly the only way to really determine whether or not the information that you're finding is valid. You have the way that we confirm information is by if multiple credible sources are telling you the same thing, then you can tell for a fact that that is indeed credible. But we also want to know when the information was last updated. Timely information is valuable. Things change very often. For example, in uh, technology, an, a scholarly article from 15 to 20 years ago may be out of date whereas but this does but this is not true for every school of study in philosophy we're still quoting aristotle so it is understandable if uh, depending on the topic when information is updated but again we want to be sure that we're getting the most up-to-date information also be sure that you know who the sponsors of the website are a lot of times there is integrated marketing integrated marketing is uh, things that look like news sources but are actually paid advertisements. Uh, you see this all the time on BuzzFeed stuff where it's like, 
what are the 10 best uh, food places in LA? Sponsored by Chipotle. Guess who's on the top of the list? So we really want to be sure that we are uh, understand who the sponsor of the website is. This could be as innocuous as that, or it could be as severe as as severe as um, uh, a news article stating that uh, mail-in ballots are more prone to voter fraud as sponsored by the uh, the Republican National Convention, uh, which uh, th and that may not be as credible of a source as a govern uh, a, a nonpartisan entity um, uh, proposing this research. And then we have we want to be sure that we're also considering the domain name. This can kind of be a Scooby Doo clue, and it can help but we want to uh but we also want to take into account all of these factors dot gov is a government entity dot edu is an education entity these two are probably going to be fairly credible sources dot org is one that is still fairly credible because it stands for nonprofit organization, but there are nonprofit organizations that are also partisan and may skew their material. And then la uh, lastly, we have .net, which is network. We're talking blogs here, and that may not be credible, but again, if it is a blog from a highly credible source, like a doctor or a researcher, then that may be fine. But we want to be careful of these. And lastly, .com commercial. We want to be even more careful of these because since they are paid for, we do want to be sure that we're watching out. So let's watch this video and we will see if this is truly a credible source. This recently discovered colony of penguins is unlike any other. <laughs> They don't need to huddle together every winter for protection against the bitter cold because these little fellas can do something no other penguins can. Ability? Well, they fly thousands of miles to the rainforest of South America where they spend the winter basking in the tropical sun. Super incredible, right? Not only is it a documentary, it's also from the BBC. Totally fine, right? As I stated before, the only way that we can truly confirm information is by confirming information from multiple credible sources. So it does require a little bit of effort, but we will for sure know the information and we will be able to, and when we apply this principle to uh, all the information that we see, it will help us get to the uh, better information most often. And we will be inoculated from fake news. And obviously that was a not credible, that penguins don't actually fly. So next we talk about using libraries. And you could 
go into the library and ask librarians, help, I'm lost, and they will help you. But we can also use the library databases. The library databases contain access to full magazine articles and newspapers, full television radio scripts, information that is updated weekly, and articles of higher editorial scrutiny. What happens with the editorial process is fascinating. A researcher will be working on something for years, get it, uh, finish it, then they will send it to an article or, or, or a journal. Then, that journal will send that article to multiple peers, multiple people who are established in the field, and those credible sources will then edit that and look to see, no, this is good, no, this is not good, and they will either accept it or reject it. If it is accepted by most of the uh, uh, editors, then they then it will be published in the journal. Whereas, if it is not, if it is rejected, goes in the trash, and the person who um, put that information in may, in fact, even lose their job, because, not because of that article, but because a lot of times in these academic um, venues, there is a push to publish. So, Again, this is the gold standard of information because of this very high editorial scrutiny. Some helpful tips of accessing this is using simple alert, uh, Boolean terms. Search within a date range because if you are talking about technology, you, oh, maybe the uh, things that are past 10 years old may not be valuable. Also using quotation marks. This can give you an exact phrase and follow the directions of the database that you're using. So who has access to these library databases? You do. Will you have access after you graduate? No, you will not. Knowledge is power, and power is kept behind a paywall. The college spends a lot of money so that the entire school has access to these databases, so use it while you can. Informative and persuasive speeches, you will need to use database sources, and if you choose something that you are passionate about, then you will find the best information on this thing that you are incredibly passionate about and learn new information. So this is an opportunity, not a, not something that you have to do. Well, it is something that you have to do, but it is also an opportunity. And what is a Boolean term? Well, there are many Boolean terms. The first Boolean term is and. So this is to narrow the search. If you are do re if you put in the search things recruitment and HR, then it is not looking for things that just have recruitment or things that just have HR. It is only the things that have both recruitment and HR. If you use the Boolean term or, then it widens the search. Recruitment or recruiting, not only is it things that search, uh, searches that have both of those key terms, but also that have either of those terms. Then the Boolean term not is another one that could be useful. This is to narrow the search again. You're, if you're saying recruitment, not HR, then it would have everything that's in with, within recruitment, but will then remove things that have HR. And the quotes is just searching for that specific uh, wording. And those are the Boolean terms. When citing research, when do you cite your research? You always state the source of the information when 
you use an idea that someone else has already expressed, when you borrow from someone else's work to develop your own ideas, when you use direct quotations, when you're paraphrasing, or any time that it is not common knowledge. They, we really have to be sure that we're citing. If it is not cited, then it is plagiarism. And plagiarism is bad, okay? Not only will it be avoiding plagiarism, it will also allow us an opportunity to, uh, to communicate our credibility. It will show, hey, I'm credible because I found this wealth of information from credible sources. And also, it will improve your grade. I will be like, whoa, this person had amazing source citation. Let's give them an A. So really be sure that you're citing information because not only does it, uh, is it avoiding plagiarism, it also improves your credibility and improves your grade. When citing uh, information in a speech, there are three places that you cite it. First, in the work cited of your outline. Second of all, in the text of the outline. And third, verbally, as you're saying the speech. And the reason why you say it in the speech is because you want to show that you are getting this information from credible sources, which will help your, which will uh, make your information more supportive. When citing information verbally, you should always use said, source, author, information, and date. And you could even ad-lib it. As stated by James Arroyo in an article published in the Communication Journal on uh, July 2017, he stated that blank. It is very simple to take the work cited um, the works cited citation that you already have and just place these uh, and just ad lib it and make, uh, make very high quality verbal citations. So we've talked about research. We've collected all of this information. Great. And we even have citations for it. Wonderful. Now it's time to move from research to support. What we do is we take the information from the research and then transform it into support. And there are many different types of support that we can transform it into. But before we talk about that, let's talk about where it goes. We're going to work from the bottom to the top. So we start with the, well, first, Let's talk about the thesis statement. This is a claim about what your topic is. Today, I'm going to talk to you about elephants. Then, I'm going to have three main points of that. First, the black market, the ivory trade of, of elephants' tusks. Second, talk about their natural habitat. And third, talk about how they may be coming in danger, how they may be uh, becoming endangered. Then, within, let's just say, the ivory trade. First, talk about why they use it, what, 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 the, what the tusks are used for, how they, are, uh, um, how they get them, and steps that are being used to prevent poaching. So, with thesis statement, it was a claim. With the main points, those were claims. With subpoints, those were claims as well. They were categories in which the support is going to go into. 
So the thesis statement, the main points, and the sub points should be no longer than one sentence. Why is that? Because if it is more than one sentence, then it is more than one idea. If it is more than one sentence, then it is more than one idea. So, to avoid confusing the audience, we want to be sure that we just have one sentence in those. Where we may have multiple sentences and where we get the meat of our speech comes with the support, the sub-sub points. In the sub-sub points, we are going to have the big three types of support. Testimony, this is what people say. Examples are things that have happened, and statistics and numerical data, numerical trends across a population, or just in general numbers. So we start with testimony, and let's think of this as a courtroom, because courtrooms use testimony all of the time, not just uh, well, personal testimony is one that we can use at times, but very sparingly. The reason why we use this sparingly is because it is not outside of our perspective, so it is very much our opinion, but it can sometimes be used to improve our credibility of the situation as well as create relevance with the audience. A good example of this could be if I, uh, if I lost someone due to a drunk driver and I I may talk about that situation, and I might bring that up to create an emotional appeal, create relevance with the audience, as well as credibility uh, for this topic. But that would not be my only support, obviously. Now let's jump to the courtroom. We may have lay testimony. Lay testimony is someone's perspective on something or someone's opinion of something. This may be a person who may have seen the defendant actually do the thing that he's accused of, or he or she. This, uh, outside of the courtroom, this may be uh, if you're trying to understand the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, you may have a protester uh, talking about why they were there, what they feel about this topic. Then we move on to expert testimony. In a courtroom, this may be a blood spatter expert or a um, or some other expert of uh, that either provides facts of what is true or what is not true, or to predict things that are in the future. A good example of prediction, talking about a meteorologist. That is expert testimony. In the same way, we have politicians or uh, talking heads on news that portray themselves as experts and thereby predict things that are going to happen. Then we have examples. There are factual examples. If we are talking about, let's say, the Electoral College, a factual or brief example of the Electoral College may be the 2016 election, where uh, you know uh, the Republican candidate won uh, the more electoral votes, where but lost more of the popular votes. Uh, then we have extended examples. This may be if you are talking about how social media played into uh, the results of the 2016 election, then you may want to have a more extended example of multiple things that have happened throughout and thereby uh, that thereby impacted the election. And then you could have a hypothetical example. What would happen if the Electoral College were abolished? What would happen if it was purely popular? May at look something like this. So all three of these can be used and should be used. And 
These are things that you will very easily find within your research. So as you're researching, you should start to look for these sorts of things, uh, testimony as well as examples. And in the same way, when you are, uh, once you have that research, then trying to look for these things in it. And then the very last bit of the big three types of support are statistics and numerical data. These are just numbers, percentages, um, the amount of a population of uh, the amount of people who believe one way or are one way, etc. How many people have died with this thing that's happening? So make sure that the statistics are from a reliable source and you should identify the source. So many times, unfortunately, it happens where someone will say uh, 20, uh, 20,000 people believe that pineapple belongs on pizza. Great, um, great, great, great support. S great statistic for what you're saying. But there is no citation. And as a result, I can no longer use it. It is, it is therefore unsupported because it could have come from anywhere. So be sure that you... Uh, identify the source of the statistic, not just, um, not just for um, uh, statistics, but also for examples and testimony in particular. Also use numbers and units that the audience can understand. How many people is 20,000 people? We can't really visualize it. But if we think about the amount of people that go to your college, then that is around 20,000 people, and that puts it into perspective. It can also, we can also clarify and explain these statistics by using graphs or charts. That can help the audience better understand this. But be sure that you don't use too many statistics. Law of diminishing returns. You will only get so much from this. Um, I, I, you will only get so much from this. There are other types of support. There are definitions. Uh, so those were the big three, but we're only going to be, uh, but there are some others that may not be so commonly used. We have definitions, uh, defining what something is. This may be valuable if your topic is very, un, uh, is very complex and maybe things that we don't already know. Imagine trying to take a math class without understanding the terms. So sometimes we have to define the terms. We also have visual and audio aids. A good example of this being used was that someone once did an informative speech on um, on horror movies and how they use silence to build suspense and they used small little video clips that then showed that that was far more effective than any example or testimony instead we actually saw it in the same way if you are talking about a big earthquake having a video of that earthquake would be highly valuable but Please be sure that with visual and audio aids that they are purposeful. They have some sort of purpose. Something else to keep in mind, though, um, that with our visual aids, if you are using a video, it can be no longer than 45 seconds. The reason why is because I want you to be the one talking. And then we compare and contrast. We can compare and contrast either literally saying that, you know, an Apple iPhone is like an Android except for these certain things, or contrast them. It can be taken literally in that way, or it can be figurative with simile and metaphor. And then the last types of supports and ones that, we, again, we do not want to rely on as heavily are personal experiences and narration, 
descriptions of things, just describing something and explaining something. Yes, description and explanation may be required for an example or a statistic or a testimony. Uh, so those things are times when you would use description and explanation. But if they are used on their own, then the reason why they are not effective is because they are now not outside of our perspective. The reason for support is that it is outside of our perspective and therefore you cannot argue that those things do not exist. This person actually said this thing outside of my perspective. This thing, example, actually happened outside of my perspective. These statistics from these credible sources were actually measured so these numbers actually exist. Whereas, I believe this because, you know, I had an experience once when this happened and this was the meaning of it. That is not as supportive as those other ones. So again, we use support because it is outside of our perspective and therefore it is unquestionable. And that concludes supporting your ideas. I hope that this was helpful. And, and, again, and as always, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. Have a great rest of your day. I will see you next time.